So everyone, we're down uh, to a half hour more for our uh, 2010 faculty summit. This is the sixth one and just about winding to a close. But I'm very glad that uh, in many ways uh, we have uh, one of the very best speakers at Google last on the agenda. Uh, and that is Vint Cerf. So I get to uh, work with Vint, uh, I would say weekly, pretty much. We get to chat with each other, and it's always a great joy. I think you'll see some very interesting observations uh, from Vint as he looks at uh, what is going on, both in the network and more broadly. So Vint? You know, I always get nervous when people clap before you said anything because I figure you should just sit down because it won't get any better than that. I apologize, actually. I'm very disappointed that I wasn't with you yesterday. I was out at uh, UC Berkeley at uh, George Smoot's Cosmology Lab, and I came away very humbled to realize that in, in, as we enter the second decade of the 21st century, we know less about the universe than we thought we knew at the end of the 19th century. 95% uh, of all of the energy and matter in the universe is a mystery to us now. Dark matter and dark energy are just things we are pretty convinced are there. Certainly dark matter, we don't know what they are. So uh, I came kind of crawling back, uh, you were about to say. Yeah, I was going to say, Vin, but uh, I would think that the, the protocols you developed for interstellar internet would solve all these issues. What's gone wrong? Uh, yes, well, <clears throat> we have a few little problems like the speed of light is too slow. Uh, if, if you're looking for a research challenge, if you could quintuple the speed of light, this would be very helpful. Um, but let's see where else we can go. Uh, one Remember, now, I'm kind of the plumber guy, right? So I'm not up here in, ap in application space. I'm the guy who's worried about what's happening in the uh, pipes and the, uh, the roads and everything underneath a lot of the things that have been talked about. So here's one thing, the number of machines on the internet, uh, we used to double every year, now it's probably more like uh, five to six years doubling rate, although this is only for machines that are visible on the net. There are a lot of them hiding behind firewalls that we can't see, so we don't know how many there are. Google has a lot of them that you don't see directly because they don't have uh, domain names and things like that. Uh, so this number is, uh, is increasing, it's in the uh, 750 million range now plus the ones that are not so visible. This is the number of internet addresses that are available. We're down uh, to about under 8% of the IPv4 address space. So we will run out this year or certainly early in 2011, uh, which motivates the need for implementing uh, IPv6 everywhere if we want to continue to grow the internet. It's, can you imagine selling a telephone and saying it's a really nice little gadget, it's great, there's only one little problem, it doesn't have a telephone number so you can't use it to make phone calls, but otherwise it's a very nice little device. The ISPs have not fully recognized the significance of this curve, uh, but I recently uh, acquired uh, this little sculpture from um, Dr. Seuss, and I thought this little remark on top of it was very appropriate. That's sitting in the middle of my dining room table. But in fact, yeah, you should be implementing IPv6. If you haven't already started, you're late. Google has been working on this for uh, almost two years now. Uh, it's not a huge team of people, but it takes a lot of effort to go find every place in all the software that thinks that an internet address is 32 bits long and convinces it that it could be 128 bits long. Uh, so it, the time to start is now. It's not flipping a switch. It's a question of getting both protocols to run concurrently and in parallel. Uh, that adds complexity to the operating environment because now you have error messages coming from both flavors. Uh, you have uh, routing systems that have to be routing for both v4 and v6. You have the possibility of somebody with a v6-only address trying to get to a v4-only server. There are all kinds of complexities that are uh, a consequence of having to run two different uh, non-interoperable IP address spaces at the same time. So uh, there are some rich areas for uh, certainly research and development. Uh, there are 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses in IPv6, uh, and that leads uh, some people to think they can uh, use those addresses uh, for things other than simply identifying endpoints in the network. Uh, this makes me nervous because first, they may consume more address space than necessary, and second, any time you overload uh, any particular identification system, you run into potential serious hazards. Uh, but that IPv6 uh, uh, 
rollout is in progress as slowly as it, as it has been. The second thing which is happening and which I think also has a lot of interesting uh, properties is that the domain name system is now being altered to incorporate non-Latin character sets. For many years, domain names were made up of the letters A through Z and 0 through 9 and a hyphen. Now they can contain uh, glyphs from the uh, much, uh, not all of, but much of the Unicode uh, character set. Uh, the World Wide Web uh, originally used Unicode, and that means that uh, it was very expressive in terms of the world's languages. Now, finally, the domain name system is catching up. That does lead to some problems. Those of you who are familiar with uh, Greek, uh, Cyrillic, and uh, uh, Latin characters will know that the, uh, many of them look the same. They have origins that are, are similar, and so that can lead to confusion because the Unicode codes for these look-alike characters are different, so the computer doesn't know that they're uh, the same. So there are some risk factors and some issues that uh, we need to address, some of which could require some clever uh, rules uh, in order to uh, eliminate or at least min minimize some of the errors that could occur, many of which would be deliberate, someone deliberately trying to cause you to go to the wrong place uh, on purpose. Uh, that leads to another observation. The domain name system itself has been fairly uh, weak in terms of uh, protection, so phishing and farming and so on have been serious problems. Uh, on July 15th, the root zone file was digitally signed, which means that when you do a lookup for a top-level domain now, if you ask the domain name system to deliver a digitally signed answer, you can get a digitally signed answer, which allows you to verify that the IP address and the domain name that you've looked up uh, have integrity, that is to say they haven't been altered. Now we hope, uh, having finally got to the point that the root zone file has been digitally signed now that the other top level and lower level domains will follow suit. Some top level domains have been signed even in advance of the root, uh, but this is a very important new development uh, in the internet. Uh, and finally, uh, routing has been a big issue because it's possible to hijack uh, the routing system by simply announcing that you own a piece of address space. And if somebody believes you and starts routing in that direction, you can cause traffic to flow in a direction you don't want it to. An example of that happened in Pakistan some months ago when it decided that the, the, some officials in Pakistan didn't like something on YouTube and they told the internet service providers in Pakistan to please shut down YouTube. And they chose to do it by black holing the IP address of YouTube, except that they published this uh, the, um, in the routing table, global routing tables and propagated the information to a large fraction of the internet, which cut YouTube off from more than just Pakistan. Pakistan. They claim that that was an accident. Uh, I don't have any comment on that because I don't have any further information. But the fact that it's possible to do that is a serious vulnerability. The plan now is for the regional internet registries to digitally sign entries in their assignment tables so that if someone announces you can get uh, to this IP address with this autonomous, through this autonomous system, namely me, the recipient of that routing update can actually validate that the uh, table entry uh, it gives the authority to that to autonomous system to announce that address. And if they don't have that authority, you should not only ignore that routing update, but maybe wave a red flag and say there are some serious problems. These are all really quite major changes to the Internet architecture, which up until now has been pretty stable for the last 30 years or so. Uh, and the last three bullets on here just draw your attention to the fact that there are other things that are becoming part of the Internet environment. SensorNet's the smart grid program that uh, allows smart uh, devices to be electrically, electrical, electricity consuming devices to be part of the net. And finally, mobiles that we're all carrying around really have produced a kind of Internet or at least an Internet window uh, in your pocket. Uh, again, a major change to the Internet's world. This is what some of the domain names will look like uh, as the IDNs, internationalized domain names, uh, are entered. Uh, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates got the first uh, non-Latin character set assignments for their top-level domains uh, in May of this year. Uh, here's something that I'd like to just uh, try to stimulate your thinking about. Domain names are not the only symbolic way of making references to places or things in the Internet. Uh, they happen to have been very useful, and they show up uh, in URIs, URNs, and so on. Uh, they have the property that they're insensitive to which version of IP address space you're using. That's an advantage. Uh, they also are insensitive to changes in IP address. That makes them useful because it's an indirect addressing mechanism. But they are not the only 
ways of associating an identifier with an IP address. And the reason I want to bring this up is that I think we have not yet explored some very interesting possibilities of bindings of identifiers with IP addresses that we could usefully uh, uh, initiate. So there's a handle system that Bob Kahn uh, developed at CNRI, which uses almost uh, content-free uh, strings that identify objects, a book, uh, a, a file of one kind or another, uh, an executing program, it could be anything that's, that's digital. That uh, digital object identifier is intended to survive over long periods of time. Here we're talking hundreds of years. As opposed to a domain name, which has the property that if you fail to renew the domain name registration, uh, it may either disappear and you get, you know, uh, 404 uh, address not found, or uh, if you go to that domain name thinking you're going to get a certain kind of information, you end up at a different place with different kinds of information because someone has acquired the domain name. So the URL that was associated with that object is, is not stable in the domain name system. In the uh, digital object identifier system, the intent is that it is stable. That is to say these identifiers are not ever reassigned, nor uh, do they ever uh, exit. Uh, from the uh, from the system, the dictionary that uh, that points to them, or the directory that points to them, uh, the bundle protocol, which is part of the interplanetary internet work that uh, I've been doing with JPL, <coughs> also uses identifiers that are are intended uh, to be delayed bound. So, for example, if you're on Mars and you want to get to a place on Earth. The typical way TCP IP works is that you resolve the uh, identifier first, and then you go there. And the problem with that, when you're in an interplanetary environment with very high delay and uncertainty of communication, is that by the time you get the answer back, uh, the target may have moved, it may have had its IP address change, it may no longer be accessible, it may point to the different thing. So trying to resolve the IP addresses ahead of time uh, just doesn't work very well. So a delayed binding tactic has been adopted in the uh, in the bundle protocol. This raises a more general question, which is what things, what what objects should have identifiers, uh, and how should we point to them? And I suspect that this notion of having persistent long-term identifiers is going to be more and more important as more content becomes digitally generated and stored away and people want to have access to it over long periods of time. And here I'm not talking about just years. I'm really talking about uh, decades to hundreds to years or maybe even a thousand years or more. So uh, I think one of the other questions is whether there is a way to devise such an identifier system that does not require centralization. If you look at most of the designs today, centralization is used in order to achieve uniqueness. In the domain name system, uh, it's a hierarchical structure and somebody has to hand out uh, a domain name with a prefix uh, or a suffix, depending on which way you're looking at it, uh, that's uh, uh, unique because it's under uh, hierarchical control. So one question is whether it's possible to devise uh, an identifier system that's fully distributed where uh, and you could go to any of a number of places or maybe even generate a large random number yourself and declare that's your identifier. And if the probability of collision with somebody else is low enough, you might actually get away with a kind of random generated identifier, which then gets stored away in some very distributed directory system and can be used uh, forever and ever because these numbers are never regenerated. So I, I just put it to you that this is an interesting space in which to explore. Uh, another thing which I've become quite fascinated by uh, and in which the last talk about uh, social interactions uh, has some bearing uh, is this idea that we learn new ways of interacting with uh, uh, the Internet. Uh, normally, we've used keyboards and uh, maybe touch-sensitive screens and mice to interact with uh, most of the uh, Internet, but there was a very interesting TED demonstration. The URLs are here if you care to, uh, to jot them down, um, which showed a guy wearing a, a video projection unit plus a camera plus a headset uh, plus uh, some uh, microphones. And uh, basically, the computer that he was wearing, in effect, was participating with him in the same environment that he was interacting with. And so suddenly the machine has the same opportunity 
to engage in human interaction with the same senses that we have. Now, we aren't getting to smell and we're not getting to touch, but at least we're getting to sight and sound. Gestures become feasible. I think the most uh, attractive example that he gave, uh, he doesn't have to have a laptop or a desktop or a notepad. If he needs to project something, he just projects it on the wall or on somebody's T-shirt or on his hand. So at one point, uh, he needed to make a phone call, so he projected the keypad onto his hand. Now, the uh, camera that he was wearing could see his hand and could see the, the pad on his hand, and then he touched the numbers that he wanted to dial, and uh, the system figured out that he wanted to make a phone call, and so it made a voice over IP call for him. But the fact is that he had his computer engaged in the same um, interactive environment that the human beings were in, and I find that a very intriguing kind of path to follow. We sort of touch on that at Google. We have speech understanding on mobiles. Uh, and on laptops, and we have the Google goggles where you take a picture of something and then say, what is it? Uh, we're not too bad at answering some of the questions, like a book cover, for example, or maybe a wine label or a picture of a famous landmark. We're not too good at a lot of other pictures that we don't know how to interpret, but that's an attempt to get the computer to be more interactive with us in normal human uh, discourse. Now, my wife has two cochlear implants, and I have to admit that one of the things I've been thinking about is to take her speech processor, which, which takes sound in, does a Fourier transform, figures out which frequencies are present, and then sends electrical impulses into her cochlea, into the auditory nerve. The brain interprets those signals as sound. And so she hears essentially normally. She interacts with people, listens to the television, or makes phone calls. So I thought, well, what would happen if I put TCP IP into the... Uh, speech processors so that she could say something. She's got microphones, otherwise she couldn't hear. So she would say a question. That would go in, get turned into voice over IP, get sent as packets to a Google machine. The answer would come back, be converted into voice over IP packets again, maybe with a text-to-speech processor. It would go back and it would go straight into her head because it would never make it outside anywhere. She would simply be hearing what the computer was saying thanks to the speech processor. And I haven't gotten all to the way to the point of doing that, but it, it is an intriguing possibility. It's not the same as doing cognitive interactions with somebody. It's not like sucking thought out of their heads, but it gets you know an interesting connection to the net. Well, that leads to this other thing, which is lots and lots of devices are gonna show up on the net. And so you may hear this internet of things I don't know really what the implications are of having billions of devices on the Internet, but there will be appliances that you find around the house, in the office, in the car, things you carry around with you, things that are embedded in the buildings, things that are outside, that are all part of this networked environment, generating information, sharing information with each other, sending status information, uh, engaging in control. One thing that's pretty clear is that if we're going to put our entertainment system up on the Internet, for example, and many of them are already, you want strong authentication to make sure that the 15-year-old next door doesn't reprogram your uh, entertainment system and you discover things on the DVR that you didn't anticipate. Uh, there are lots of reasons why we need better authentication in the network. Uh, and finally, a lot of these devices are going to act as um, store and forward routing systems in addition to being uh, sensors. So uh, you've all seen these things before, I mean, refrigerators that are internet enabled or picture frames. Uh, I remember my first reaction with the picture frame was that it sounded like it was something that was as useful as an electric fork. You know? <laughs> but in fact, it's actually quite uh, convenient because you just upload uh, your digital photographs to some website the picture frame wakes up every 24 hours, downloads the pictures, and then you get up to see what the family's been doing around the country by just watching the pictures circulating. Again, security is an issue here because if somebody breaks into the website that the picture frame is downloading from, the grandparents may see pictures that they hope are not of the grandchildren. So uh, security is an important issue here. The guy in the middle is the one I like the most. He's invented an internet-enabled surfboard. I guess he was just bored sitting on the water waiting for something to happen. And he said, well, if I put a laptop in my surfboard, I can surf the Internet while I'm waiting for the other stuff. So uh, he put a Wi-Fi server back on the rescue shack on the beach, and he sells this as a product. Just to give you an example of a sensor net, I have one in my house. It's running IPv6. Uh, and by the way, this is not me in the garage with a soldering gun. This is actually a commercial system made by a company called Artrock. Uh, there are a dozen sensors in the house, one in each room, and it's picking up uh, the uh, temperature, the humidity, and the light levels in every room in the house every five minutes and storing it away in a server down in the basement. 
Um, at the end of the, I know it sounds like something only a geek would do, but at, at the end of the year, I have a year's worth of information about heating and uh, cooling distribution in the house. I have a real raw engineering data about how well the system has worked, and when it comes to optimizing, I have good solid information to work from. The wine cellar is instrumented, uh, and uh, if the temperature goes above 60 degrees, I actually get an SMS on my mobile to tell me that my wine is heating up. Uh, it actually happened to me when I was going to visit Argonne National Laboratory for a few days. I, I walked in, and just as I went into the building, my mobile went off. It was a wine cellar calling. And for several days afterwards, every five minutes, I got this note saying, your wine is getting hotter. I got home, uh, and it was 70 degrees in the wine cellar, so uh, you know, I, I reactivated the cooling system. Then I called Artrock, and I said, do you make remote actuators? And they said yes, so that's a little project. I also thought I, I thought about uh, you know the, the, that I could tell if somebody's gone into the wine cellar when I'm away because I can see the lights go off and on, uh, but I don't know what they did. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I should put RFID chips on each bottle, and then I can do an instantaneous inventory to figure out if anything has left the wine cellar without my permission while I'm away. And uh, somebody pointed out to me that you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. So, <laughs> so yeah, now I have to put sensors in the cork. You know, so. um, <clears throat> here's another example of what happens when you have an Internet of Things. Imagine you have an Internet-enabled washing machine, and uh, and you spilled the mayonnaise, you know, on, on a blouse or a shirt or something. So you go to the web and you say, uh, you know, what do I do about mayonnaise stains on silk? Procter & Gamble website comes back and says, uh, I can answer this question, uh, what kind of a machine do you have? What kind of washing machine do you have? And you answer that, and it says, well, you should use this kind of soap, uh, and here's how much you should use. And then they say, uh, you know, is your machine on the net? And if you say yes, it says fine, no problem, and it sends notes off to the machine, fixes the parameters of the machine for the temperature and the washing cycle and what kind of... Uh, you know how rough or, or gentle the uh, washing should be, and then it says to throw your uh, your blouse into the machine, pour in this uh, special soap, and then uh, you're done. So what Procter and Gamble has just done is to take a product and turn it into a service because the machine was online, and you can imagine all kinds of scenarios like that. The smart grid is something which is uh, underway in the United States. The idea is to get machines to respond to messages like the uh, cost of electricity is going up. Maybe you don't want to heat water right now or you don't want to run the washing machine. But that's just the beginning. That's electricity. I think in the end we should be paying attention not only to the way we consume electricity but other resources as well. If we instrument things, we'll get good feedback to uh, our population about the decisions that we make in our lifestyles and how they consume resources and maybe we can do a better job of uh, careful consumption. Uh, you can imagine having to talk to all those devices. You remember C-3PO and it's uh, it was one of the uh, translating systems that uh, was part of the Star Wars picture. And finally, to give you a quick uh, update on where we are with the interplanetary Internet, this is a project that got started at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 1998. Our premise was that point-to-point -point radio links were not a very rich uh, environment in which to support extensive, complex space exploration with multiple rover devices, with humans, uh, with sensor networks and the like. Instead of having a point-to-point -point link going from Earth to the target, uh, what we were interested in is building a rich networking capability in the same sense that the Internet provides that here on planet Earth. And we uh, got some examples of the utility of the store and forward style networking. Uh, the rovers uh, on Mars, which landed in January of 2004, were intended to transmit data straight back to Earth at 28 kilobits a second. Uh, with a point-to-point -point radio link uh, to the deep space network. And when they turned those radios on, they overheated. So the first reaction is uh, reduce the duty cycle to keep them from damaging themselves. The scientists were very unhappy about that because they already didn't like 28 kilobits per second and now they were getting less data back. But the engineers said, well, there's an X-band radio on board each of the rovers. It could go at 128 kilobits a second, but it can only go up to about where the orbiters are. Well, the orbiters were in place in order to map the surface of Mars to figure out where the rover should go. And uh, they decided to repurpose those orbiters, which had completed their mapping mission, and make them store and forward nodes of a little tiny three-node network. So all the data that's coming back from Mars now is going store and forward uh, back to, uh, to Earth by way of their uh, relays in the, um, in the orbiters. 
they because that worked so well they did the same thing with the phoenix lander that landed in may of 2008 it didn't have any direct path back to earth they had to use the rover the uh, uh, orbiters as a storm forward system so uh, we thought we could start using tcp ip and we were quickly disabused of this idea um, the f first problem is the distance between the planets is astronomical uh, literally <laughs> And uh, the consequence of this is that, you know, it takes, first of all, it's variable, right? Because our distance changes as a function of where we are in our orbits. So we have this variable delay. And second, it's really long. So from Earth to Mars, it's 20 minutes round trip time at the speed of light. Uh, I'm sorry, 20 minutes one way and 40 minutes round trip time at the speed of light to get to and from Earth, between Earth and Mars. And you can imagine, you know, click, click your mouse and wait for 40 minutes. It's like some of the networks on Earth. But... Then there's this other problem, celestial motion. You know, the planets are rotating, and we haven't figured out how to stop that. So uh, if there's something on the surface of the planet that you're talking to and the planet rotates, you can't talk to it anymore because it's you know, disrupted. So we have a variable delay and disruption in the network, and TCP IP does not work well in that environment. So we had to invent a whole new suite of protocols that we call the bundle protocol. They've been tested terrestrially in a variety of environments, including tactical military, where it actually worked out quite well. We've got the protocols on board the space station now. We have them uh, on a spacecraft called Epoxy, which is on its way out to rendezvous with the comet Hartley-2 at the end of this year. We've already done some deep space testing with the Epoxy spacecraft. Uh, Intelsat-14 has a Cisco router on board, and uh, it has an auxiliary processor, and our plan is to upload the uh, bundle protocols to that uh, as well. Uh, and then we've got an implementation of the uh, DTN protocols in uh, Android. So uh, at the end of this year, the beginning of next year, it's conceivable that we'll be able to take an Android mobile and send a message that goes all the way to the epoxy spacecraft, goes to the space station, and then comes back down to Earth again. And uh, for those of you who are fans of history, there's a guy named uh, Dave Mills who did the first NSFNet fuzzball system, and he always used to talk about Martian packets. We're going to send them a real Martian packet. I can hardly wait. So that's the state of the uh, of affairs. What we're hoping, frankly, I'm going to skip through this because it's almost time to finish. Uh, what we're hoping will happen is not that we build this big interplanetary backbone and that somebody shows up, you know, including aliens. What we're trying to do is to create a, a framework in which people who adopt the standards can then interwork, whether it's NASA or JAXA or ESA or any of the other space agencies. If their spacecraft will use these protocols, they can interwork. They don't have to, but they can. And second, once those spacecraft have completed their primary missions, they can be repurposed to become part of an interplanetary backbone. So I would predict, if we're successful, that over the next several decades, we'll literally grow an interplanetary backbone mission by mission and make use of it both for manned and for robotic exploration. So that's up to the date on the interplanetary net. It's 1230. I'm happy to take questions, or if you want to go run off to lunch, I won't be insulted. But thank you for coming today.